Well, good morning, and I am Kenny Polkauer, your host of the party, and yes, today is Tuesday, July 11th, 2023, and it is a spectacular day here on Cape Cod. Look, if you go right out there, you're going to go right through Woods Hole and out the mouth of Zinnian. It is absolutely beautiful here today. So let's talk about it. What is it that you need to know? What's happened over the last couple of days, and what is it that investors should be concerned about? Well, first of all, there's more Fed speak, right? And they're all calling for higher rates. It was Master, it was Daily, it was Kashkari, right? The dollar index, uh, that declines because we're at the top of this rate hiking cycle. Cycle, at least close to it, and that's what the traders think. Commodities rise on a weaker dollar, right? Oil and gold are both up. And what should you do? You should allocate to the underperformers in a defensive play over the next three or four months as the market probably um, experiences some turmoil. And what are we have for dinner tonight? We're going to have the grilled ribeye with arugula and grana padano. Okay, so we're going to get to that in just a moment. So look, stocks kicked off the week yesterday on a stronger note, even though there was lots of Fed commentary high highlighting the need for higher rates in order to bring inflation down uh, closer to that 2% target rate, right? Mary Daly, like I told you, you remember her, right? She's a San Francisco Fed president uh, and a voting member of the FOMC. She's the one who fell down when it came to regulating the banks out in her region, recall Silicon Valley Bank. Well, anyway, she came out yesterday, she came out of hiding and she told investors that we are, and I quote, we are likely to need a couple of more rate hikes over the course of the year. She was then joined by the non-voting member, but very vocal Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mesta, who has been calling for 6% terminal rates for months now, all while the market has been pricing in a four and three quarter rate initially before recognizing that maybe the terminal rate needed to be more like five and a quarter percent. And now that looks like that isn't even going to be enough. Mester telling investors that in order to ensure that inflation is on a sustainable and timely path back to 2%, the funds rate will need to move up somewhat further from its current level and then hold there for a while longer as we accumulate more information on how the economy is evolving. So here you go, here you hear that 6% terminal rate once again, and it's a rate that she's been uh, that she's been talking about for months, right? Then we had Fed Vice Chair uh, Mikey Barr. He spoke about a plan to require more capital on hand for the largest U.S. banks, right? Warning us that we need to be skeptical about the ability of bank managers and regulators to anticipate all the emerging risks. Again, think about what happened to those handful of super regional banks out in the West Coast, right, that imploded this spring. Now, not to sound the alarm, all of our largest banks are in great shape, uh, and the most recent stress test kind of proves that point, right? But what it does suggest is that regulators may be concerned about potential hidden risks as we move through this economic cycle, right? So think about commercial real estate loans. They've been talking all about that and what effect that may have on some of the big banks as these loans come due. Now, by the end of the day yesterday, the Dow actually gained 210 points or six tenths of a percent. The S&P added 11 points or a quarter of a percent. The NASDAQ gained 25 points or uh, two tenths of a percent. The Russell surged, adding 31 points or 1.6%, while the transports added 160 points or 1%. There wasn't any real economic data yesterday to drive the action, um, and there isn't really any today. And that left investors, and it leaves investors, to focus on the data that's due out tomorrow and Thursday, and then the kickoff of earnings season on Friday morning. The big numbers this week are the latest inflation point, uh, the data points for June. The CPI, which is due out tomorrow at 8.30, is expected to show that the core inflation rate remains at 5% year over year. That's a good three percentage points more than the target, and that will be the ongoing issue for J.J. Powell. Now, look, CPI on the top line month over month is expected to rise three-tenths of a percent. That's up from one-tenth last month, so that's not good because it shows inflation rising again. While the core CPI month over month, which is X food and energy, is expected to show a slight decline coming in at plus three tenths, which would be down from four tenths. And this is what they're going to focus on, right? This slight decline in the core rate month over month. Remember, while the CPI is trending lower, it doesn't mean that prices are in decline. All it means is that prices are increasing at a slower pace. That's all, right? But they are still increasing. We're also going to get average hourly earnings year over year and average weekly 
earnings year over year, so we all want to see what that data is going to show. Are they being, you know, our wages going up, our earnings going up? And then at 2 p.m., we're going to get the Fed Beige Book, right, which details the state of the U.S. economy in the 12 Federal Reserve regions of the country. Now, while this is interesting, honestly, it's really not a market mover at all. Then on Thursday, that's going to bring us the June PPI report, which is what which is the what prices are doing at the producer level, which ultimately make their way to the consumer level, right? Now, PPI on the top line month over month is expected to show an increase of up two tenths. That's up from last month's negative three tenths. So again, that's swinging in the wrong direction, right? X Food and Energy is going to be up one tenth versus last month's zero uh, percent. Uh, so that's also a little bit higher. Year over year PPI is expected to be up four tenths of a percent, while the core rate, X Food and Energy, is expected to be up 2.6 percent. Both better numbers than last month, right? So that will be the positive in that. Earnings tomorrow include uh, Foot Locker, Pepsi, Progressive, and Fast and L. And then on Friday, we're going to get the Uni University of Michigan data point. Sentiment is supposed to be 65.5. That's up a little bit over last last week. One year in uh, last month, excuse me. One year inflation expectation of 3.1% with a five to 10 year inflation outlook of 3%. But it's also the official start of earnings season. And we look for, we're going to see earnings from JP Morgan, BlackRock, United Health, State Street, Citibank, and Wells Fargo. And I say it's a official because JP Morgan is the first Dow stock to report and that is considered the official start of the earnings race. Second quarter earnings are expected to decline by 7.2% according to FactSet. But we all know that's not always the case. Earnings end up surprising mostly the upside due to all the downward revisions ahead of time. And I expect the same reporting, the same thing to happen this reporting season as well. So far, we've heard from 18 S&P companies with 14 of them surprising to the upside. That's a 77 percent. 77 percent of the companies have surprised. 12 of them reported a revenue surprise. That's a 64 percent revenue surprise. As of this morning, the S&P is trading at 19.6 times forward earnings of $224 a share, leaving it above the long-term 10-year average of 17.4 percent. And with the terminal rate now expected at 6 percent and stay there, investors will most likely have to reprice risk as if it appears that the earnings number is going to be too high, but we're about to find that out over the course of the next three weeks. Amazon today kicks off its Amazon Prime Day, right, which is usually the biggest shopping day of the year for Amazon. Expect all kinds of discounts in order to get consumers to spend your money, and then expect the media to tell us how strong the consumer is because this is surely going to blow the roof off the house, right, suggesting that the economy is strong as well. Something I would debate isn't really true, but it is what it is. If Amazon on succeeds in getting you to spend your money, then I guess you're not feeling the pinch. And then the media will be correct. In any event, the stock is quoted up 60 cents in the pre-market at 127.70, 127.80. Last night it closed at 127, I think 15 cents. Oil this morning is trading at 73.25 a barrel. That's up 9% in the last two weeks. Recall last week that I said we were in the 71.30, 73.60 trading range. A test of 73.60, which is resistance, trend line resistance, will prove to be tough to get through unless OPEC gets even more aggressive with production cuts. Remember, they want to see oil at $80 a barrel. And guess what? The Saudis and the Russians are due to cut production again in August, right? The Saudis already cut on July 1st. They're going to cut again in August. And that's causing a bit of concern over the supply side of the equation, all while demand remains strong. We have now tested that 7360 resistance three times over the past three days. And this morning, we trade just below it. In addition, we've seen the dollar index fall nearly 2% in the past week, and that's also helping oil and other commodities move up. Recall the inverse relationship between the dollar and commodities. I continue to believe that the Saudis are going to get oil back up to the key $80 level that they need to support their lifestyle. So whether it's production cuts or a weaker dollar, we are going to get there, my guess is, before summer's over. Gold, another commodity, traded down to the long-term support a couple of weeks ago uh, at 1900 right? We talked about that, and it held some something that I expected it to do. It has now bounced off that uh, th that support level and is trading at the $19.45 an ounce this morning. That's up 2.5% over the past 10 days. This as the dollar has weakened. Now, gold remains in the 1900-1975 trading range until we get more uh, more uh, of an idea of what the dollar is going to do over the next uh, month or so. And the dollar index is slipping because the Fed has signaled that while we aren't there yet, 
we are much closer to the top of the rate hiking cycle than not, and that's causing currency traders to sell the dollar. The dollar index is now below all three of its trend lines, but appears to be holding at the April-May lows of 101. So we are now in the 101-103 trading range. And U.S. Treasuries, yep, yields are up. Right, The three- and six-month bills are yielding 5.45% and 5.5% respectively, while the two-year is now yielding 4.8%. And the 10-year is kissing 4%. 12-month bank CD rates are approaching 5.3%. And this, these will all prove to be a bit of a headwind for stocks as investors look for less volatility and more stability in the months ahead as we go through the summer and into early fall. Remember, early fall is always kind of a, uh, a volatile season. And U.S. futures this morning are struggling to stay higher. Dow futures up nine, the S&Ps are up five, the Nasdaq's up 20, and the Russell's up five. Investors trying to decipher all the most recent Fed statements and warnings of higher for longer rate levels. Look, investors are pricing in a soft landing, something I don't think we're gonna see, although I no longer see a crash landing either. I see a softer landing, but not soft, right? Because there's a difference between a soft landing and a crash landing. I think we're going to be somewhere in between. Remember, the risk of a recession hasn't gone away, so I expect the developed markets to run into some choppy waters over the next three months or so, which should bring valuations down a bit and more in line with the longer-term valuations. Think 17.4% of uh, forward earnings, right? And all that means is that we could see the S&P trade down to the 4,4100 range before this is over, and that would be somewhere like a 6 to 9% move, which is well within the normal trading range uh, of the market, right? Anything above 10%, then you get into a correction phase, but anywhere you know, between 0 and 9.9%, you're well within the normal range. The next hurdle for the market is going to be the start of earnings season, and that begins officially on Friday, July 14th. Expect all kinds of pre-announcements and analyst revisions in the days ahead. The S&P ended yesterday at 44.09. It was up 11 points. Last week, I said, do not be surprised to see a pullback ahead of the start of earnings season. I continue to believe that's true. And as such, I continue to put more money into those defensive sectors that performed well yesterday. So think industrials, they were up 1.4%. Healthcare up uh, eight tenths of a percent. Financials were up a half a percent. Energy up eight tenths of a percent. The SMIDs, right? The small and mid cap, IJJ and IJT, they were up 1.2 and 1.4% respectively. The value trade, SPYV, was up a half a percent while the growth trade was flat. SPYG was flat yesterday. In the end, you know what the deal is. You stick to the plan. Don't make emotional decisions. Always happy to discuss it. So give me a call if you want to discuss it. Happy to do that. Okay. So now, it's an absolutely gorgeous day here at the beach, as you can see. There's not a cloud in the sky. Well, one little tiny one right, right over there, right there. But beyond that, it's really a blue sky and an absolutely gorgeous day. So we're having the dinner time. We're going to have the grilled ribeye with arugula and grana padano and some sliced red onions. Really delicious, right? So the, all you need is a couple of ingredients. For this. You need the, the, the ribeye. You need salt and pepper, olive oil, you need fresh arugula, you need sliced red onion, right, and shaved grana padano cheese. The dish is all about simplicity. Now, just FYI, grana padano is one of the most popular cheeses in Italy. It has a dif uh, a distinctly grainy texture, and it comes from uh, the Piana Pandana region, right? It's the Po Valley, it's in northern Italy. It's a semi uh it's a semi-fat hard cheese, which is cooked and ripened slowly. Minimum time to ripen is nine months for Grano Padano and up to 20 plus months for Grano Padano Reserva, which is more grainy, crumbly, and fully flavored. Okay. So now, you want to season your ribeye with salt and pepper, massage it with a touch of olive oil, allow it to rest at room temperature for 15 or 20 minutes. As you don't want to put a cold steak on the grill, right? So you want it to be more like room temperature. Now you want to heat up the grill, get it really nice and hot, clean it with the the brush so there's no uh, crumbs on it from the last time you used it. Now place the ribeye on the grill, sear it for four minutes on one side, then flip it over and cook it for another four minutes on the other side. Now depending on the thickness. If it's a really thicker piece, you might have to add a minute. If it's a thinner piece, then subtract a minute. You have to use your head on this one. Next, take it off the grill, allow it to rest for three minutes, and then carefully slice it in a diagonal and then set it on the plate to look pretty. When serving this, uh, you want to put it on warm plates, 
cover the steak with the fresh arugula and chopped red onion uh, that's been seasoned with salt and pepper, some dried oregano, olive oil, and a squirt of fresh lemon juice. Uh, to finish, dress this with razor thin slices of the grana padano cheese, put it right on top, serve it immediately. A nice house Chianti works well with this. Nothing really too, uh, too heavy. I mean, you can, if you like heavy, you can have heavy. For this, I like uh, a nice Chianti works really, really well with this. And considering uh, I'm gonna be thinking about this all day, it is absolutely a gorgeous day out. That's gonna be a delicious meal tonight. Um, it's just a perfect 10 out there. So let's hope that's what the markets do too today. In any event, until tomorrow, take good care.